my name is Marsha Lee. This is A Living History of Bronxville. Today we have a special Bronxville resident who's been in the news lately, actually. His name is Robert R. McDonald. Robert is the director of the Museum of the City of New York. Yes. We're delighted to have you. Well, thank you, Marsh. It's good to be here. Um, the reason he's been in the news uh, frequently as of late has to do with uh, Tweed Hall, right? And well, the Tweed, what is called the Tweed Courthouse. The Tweed Courthouse, right. One of the most corrupted um, courthouses in the world in terms of the construction that went into it, it was right? It was uh, one of the most expensive buildings built in 19th century America, but it's also a gorgeous example of architecture, urban architecture. With a huge rotunda that we've all seen in the papers. Yes, yeah. and in the New Yorker recently there was a grand picture of, uh, of this building, which was to say New York had arrived. It was built uh, started during the Civil War, actually, and ended construction in the mid-1880s, Yeah, a grand building. Well, now, we're going to get to that, but we're going to double back, Bob, and, and get a little information on your background and what, it, and, and what it takes to become a director of a major, major uh, museum in the city of New York. So let's begin uh, a little bit with your background. Where were you born? You're, um, born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where right. my dad uh, was a pediatrician, actually, for 50 years. Uh, uh, six brothers and sisters. Wow, and, big family. Uh, big family, and uh, spent my early years in Pittsburgh. And then you, um, you, you married a wonderful person. I, we, a lot of us know Kathy. Uh, you probably know her better than me. <laughs> I just sleep in Bronxville. Well, no, you do more than that. But Kathy is very active uh, uh, in Bronxville too. Um, so you, but you met her at college, right? We did. Uh, we met uh, blind date freshman year, and. Uh, we went together for about five years, not steady, because uh, I didn't want to get married. But you know, when you find the right one, yeah, it just obviously uh, hits you over the head. So <laughs> as I was completing my uh, first year of graduate school, we decided that uh, you'd get married. Would get married. This was at Nord Notre Dame, right? I went to the University of Notre Dame, and Kathy was at St. Mary's of Notre Dame, the sister uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. college. And you, you were telling me earlier you were going on for your PhD. Well, they, but you ended up getting a master's in American civilization and, at Notre Dame. And then what? And uh, well, they wanted me to stay uh, to get a doctorate to work on my doctorate. And they gave me a big scholarship, but I had had enough of uh, college and graduate school, at least for a while. Right. And, and by uh, this time, you were married, right? No, no not you married, married yet. yet. We were thinking ah. of getting married, and I went to my dad, and I said, "Well, Dad, Kathy, and I are thinking of getting married," and he. He said, that's great. Your mother and I love her, and uh, she was a great young woman. We couldn't be happier, but you have to have two things if you're going to get married. And I looked at my wise dad, <laughs> and he said, well, what are they, Dad? He said, first of all, you have to have a job, and second of all, you have to have life insurance. Well, I got the life insurance, and I immediately went off to Washington, D.C., looking for a job. <laughs> and what job was that? Uh, and you, I, I've got to tell you, life is a lot of chance. And just with this first job, it changed your whole life. It did. It did. Tell you, them about this. I'm so envious. I, I mean, <laughs> if only I had <laughs> this had happened well, to Well, I head off down to Washington, scrubbed and pressed. I was uh, <laughs> ready to go out and conquer the world. And uh, I did have a contact at Federal Civil Service who was helping me. And long story short, I was able to secure a job in the personnel office at the National Institutes of Health just a job. No. And before accepting it, though, I had a telephone call from my contact, and he said, uh, there's a position open at the uh, Museum of History and Technology of the Smithsonian, now called the National Museum of American History. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, I think I would be. But, but it's a curator. Very good. I went over and met my first boss, who's a dear friend of mine today still. Who uh, is that? Who is Peter that? Welsh, yeah. uh, who's retired now, lives up uh, near Lake Placid on the phone with him last week, actually, and I walked in, I, I, we called it a resume then. Right. Uh, and uh, I had my best tie on, and I was pressed, and, I, and he gave me the job, which was shocking because I wasn't really qualified, uh -huh. but I learned later why. Why did, he, why did he do this? They had a vacancy, and if it wasn't filled, they were going to lose the position. <laughs> and I was the Talk closest, about ultimate. Uh, closest one. But right it was, place at the right time situation. Well, I was always interested in history since uh, And what did you school. do there? I mean, well, you I was weren't a there too long. I, I know a, you were a curator, but of what? Well, I was a curator in a division called Growth of the United States, which was created to do an interdisciplinary exhibition on the course of American history, drawing on all the collections of the Smithsonian. Mm. 
And so we, uh, uh, drawing from the uh, First Nations, the earliest period of the United States history to the end of the 20th century, or by then and not the end, but the middle of the 20th century, uh, we were creating this walk through American history. That must have been just perfect for you, though. Well, it's a great education. You were a history major. I, you had to start with what? Uh, but I, I knew, I knew the, uh, I knew his, the book history. Yeah. But I had no experience in what uh, came to be known to me as material culture, the stuff of history. Right. And so those uh, that year at the Smithsonian, where I was in charge of moving the. Uh, folk art collection to a new gallery in charge of... Chipping off a bit of the Plymouth Rock to put it on <laughs> show or something. Well, I, I also was in charge of moving the f oldest uh, steam engine uh, train uh, uh, in the United States, Tom Thumb, from one gallery to another. I'll never forget that because the whole building shook. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, really... They have all this stuff stored in all these warehouses and all well, these places, certainly. and that's a major problem. Well, uh, as any great museum only has a small percentage of its collection on view at any one time. Yeah. Uh, this is true at the Smithsonian, where they have warehouses out at Suitland, Maryland, that have wonderful things. And a few years ago, I was head of the committee to accredit the National Air and Space Museum. And I, the reason I took the uh, assignment, I always wanted to sit in the bombardier seat of the Enola Gay. Did you? I did. Oh, I know Which, some men, uh, well, one I'll that's married to me that would just die to do the that. The reason is the stuff of history. The Enola Gay is one of the most important artifacts in 20th century history, world history. Hmm. It's a beautiful plane, uh, obviously, but it... You can read about the dropping of the first atomic bomb, but when you see the plane and you can touch it, it becomes real. Really something. And that's the power of museums, yeah. is to be able to see the real. The real. Bob, we've got to move on. We'll, we are halfway even close to the Museum of the City of New York, but I just wanted to give you also a flavor of some other things he did along the way. You left the, the Institute, um, and you went. then you became the curator of Bucks County Historical Society. Correct, in Doylestown, and one of the earliest collections of Americana, a great collection, yeah. that Henry Chapman Mercer began to gather late in the 19th century. Uh, Henry Ford used Mercer as an example when Henry Ford began gathering the collection for his museum in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, about 20 years later. Mm -hmm. But that also exposed me to a wonderful collection of folk art, craft tools, uh, Paintings, uh, Fructor, uh, right. the whole uh, range. And at that time, uh, though, you became the director, not just a curator. Well, I was a curator director. Yeah. Uh, I was only 27, so the whole staff was older than I was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some you asked earlier, how does one become a director? Uh, you learn by experience, and I have scars all over my back. Uh, I bet, I uh, bet. But it was a great... Most, was some a, of the most recent just applied, you know, right? My skin is pretty thick at this point in my career, but... Uh, it was a great experience for uh, us in, in Doylestown. Our two boys were buried there, or buried, uh, born there. <laughs> now, let's, let, we, we forgot to touch on that. Yeah. In addition to Kathy, there are three offspring. Matthew, there are. Matthew the oldest, uh, right. who's 35, married as an attorney in Hilton Head. Rob, who graduated from Bronxville High School, uh, works for DoubleClick. Uh -huh. And Katie, who also graduated from Bronxville High, just got a great new job in a PR firm in New York. Yeah. So they're all doing well. Right. Well, that's good. Anyway, so you ended up in Bucks County, and then you became, um, you moved to New Haven. Well, I continued to work towards a doctorate at the University oh. of Pennsylvania, and when it came time to do a year's residency, the National Endowment of the uh, Humanities gave me a fellowship to go to the University of Delaware for a year, which I did, and then I was offered a position to be the director of the New Haven Colony Historical Society, which is basically southern Connecticut. Uh, it's a society attached to Yale University. In fact, it's located right behind the president's home. And you were saying when you were there, you really got into the Eli Whitney well, Museum, which uh, is a... Well, I got into... Uh, it was, uh, being at Yale was a wonderful experience, uh, and uh, I taught there and also worked on a major documentation of what was one of the earliest factory towns. Eli Whitney. Who, it, New Haven. Are you well, referring to New Haven or yes. just nearby New Haven? Well, it was in Hamden, Connecticut, actually. Uh -huh. Eli Whitney, uh, we all know, invented the cotton gin. But right. when that patent, he couldn't make any money on it because everyone knew how to make one, and the government wasn't strong enough to protect his patent. So to make a living... He, when was this? When this was, was in the mid-1790s. So... And about 1798, right. he... Uh, 
works up a system to create firearms, muskets for the army, mm -hmm. using unskilled labor. They say interchangeable parts, but the American system of manufacturing is actually using tools to replace skilled labor. And he brought these farm boys in from Connecticut, built this factory, which now is, uh, the location is right below the Whitney uh, Lake Dam, the New Haven Water Company Dam. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, for the first time back in the early 70s with Yale, documented our, with archaeological digs and doing research in the archives, this very significant site in the history of American uh, manufacturing. And I'm happy. Is it, can we go there today? Yes, it's you the can. It's part of the museum. It, it is. It would be a and wonderful thing for an uh, eighth grade class to go to or something Well, it's, like a, that. it's a great site, it being the, one of the earliest factory towns. Eli Whitney's barn that he built is there, which President Madison said was the most inventive barn <laughs> in the United States in 1818. And then the Ithiel Town Trust Bridge, the cover bridge as we know it, the first one was at that site. So it's filled with all kinds of history on how America developed as a manufacturing power uh, beginning in the uh, early 19th century. Mm, must have been fascinating. Well, we still have to keep moving on, um, although you did start the um you, okay, the gun factory, you, you mentioned that in the whole thing. Um, but then you had, you became the CEO of one of the largest museums in the United States of America, and that was right down in New Orleans. Well, Tell here, us a little bit about here that. Here we are in New Haven, happier than clams, teaching at Yale, fellow at Berkeley College, and I get a call, would I be interested in becoming director of the Louisiana State Museum in New Orleans? And I remember it was late February, and uh, well, I'd never been in New Orleans, so I went. And they treated me, I mean, Antoine's, Galatoire's, and I was only 32 at the time. Uh, long story short, I arrived back in New Haven. It's snowing. <laughs> of course, the azaleas were you coming You must have out really of, wanted that job. <laughs> and I walked in because I went down. I said, I'm bored not leaving New Haven. I walked in and told, uh, asked Kathy, would she like moving to New Orleans? And we did. And we got our two kids in a Volvo with a McGovern sticker on it and drove through the Deep South in the early 70s. It was a great experience. Uh -huh. We were there 11 years. Wow. Uh, and you were the first real... Uh, first professional director of this museum, uh, which uh, is the largest cultural institution in the state of Louisiana and one of the largest museums in the Deep what South. What are its major collections? Uh, the buildings primarily, uh, you know, all in the French Quarter. Uh -huh. uh, the Cabildo, the Presbytery, all around Jackson Square. Right. The old U.S. Mint, which is the oldest mint building in the country, and then Madame John's Legacy, the Creole House. But when I was there, we also developed the museum as a statewide system. We did the old state capitol building in Baton Rouge, which is a Dakin building, and a building and a museum in Shreveport, Louisiana. It was a great experience yeah. and a learning one for me. And uh, you, uh, What exhibits did uh, you were mentioning some of the exhibits? Well, to the uh, two of them I'll mention. That during the bicentennial, we did uh, Louisiana's Black Heritage, first time ever done in the Deep South. This museum had a tremendous collection of materials related to African Americans because South Louisiana, the slavery was controlled by the Code Noir, which kept families together. Uh -huh. And there was a large population of free people of color who also owned slaves. There were artists. The first photographer was uh, uh, black. Uh, there were poets, newspapers, uh, very distinguished history, but also the history of slavery in the Deep South. And this museum had collected uh, over the, in the early part of the uh, 20th century, important materials, including the last surviving slave block in the country. Oh, so we did a conference, and I knew we were doing something right, actually, when the Ku Klux Klan marched in front of the museum <laughs> that must have been, in protest. You and, have a habit of uh, drawing. Well, that. history is about people yeah. and connecting people. Uh, and uh, that, and then later I did a, a, the largest uh, show ever in the, in the United States on Louis XIV called oh. Louis, uh, The Sun King, Louis XIV of the New World. Louisiana's name for Louis XIV. Of course, yes. And we borrowed from 26 uh, collections in France, the Louvre, Versailles, Vaux le Wow, so you had to go over there and dig oh, a lot of that stuff well, that's, out. Well, uh, that's, spending time in Paris became a delight. <laughs> I am sure. Uh, so those two, uh, we of course did a lot of other things in yeah. Louisiana, but uh, those are two I remember. Then how did they rob you away? How did the Big Apple finally come down there and move well, you again, up to New York City? I was 42, and Louis Auchincloss called me. and I He was, was the chairman of the board at the time. He was chairman of the board and a noted author, more sure. than 60 books, and real New Yorker, uh, from a, a different school from an old school in New York, but a right. real New Yorker. And I had been elected president of the American Association of Museums, our national museum group of 7,000 members. And I was on my way to Washington, actually, for a meeting, and Louis asked me to stop by New York. And as a favor to a friend, I did, because I had no interest. And, and I walked into the museum in the city of New York, a building that was a wreck, 
Good. This is at 105th Street and 5th uh, Avenue. 103rd. Right? Uh, I'm sorry, 103rd, 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 yeah. Uh, right above Mount Sinai. Georgian building that was built uh, in the early 1930s for the museum, never completed because they had ran out of money. And I walked in, and the place was not in good shape. You like uh, a challenge, don't you? Well, I uh, mean, this is the pattern that you had. And I still, I walked <laughs> out, and I said, oh, I just, uh, this is, I'm not interested. But then I really started to think about two things which make museums. One, the collection. And this was, uh, is one of the most undervalued, unknown collections in New York City. What uh, kind of things? I mean, what makes you well, say that? What, what well, kind of things are there? Well, it's 1.5 million items. Among them is one of the eight finest uh, American silver collections, the finest collection of courier knives, America's most important theater collection, over half a million uh, photographic images from the earliest ones of New York, Bernice Abbott, Jacob Rees, the, the, oh, on and wow. on. Yeah. It is a tremendous, it's the most, single most important museum resource in the history of New York City. And not much had really ever been done with it. Mm -hmm. And there was the second reason, the subject, New York, New York City. City. And I often uh, kid uh, when I talk with people, I say, well, you know, Philippe at the Met, he's got great art sculpture and Ellen Futter has bugs and stuffed animals over at Natural History and Gregory Long at the Botanical Garden, what a wonderful place, has flowers and fauna. But my museum has the greatest subject of any museum in the city, the people of New York City. Right. And that almost 400 year history was the reason uh, that combined with that collection, the opportunity to try to do something of significance for this city uh, was uh, drew us back north from uh, Louisiana 17 years ago. To and to off. Bronxville. You came right to Bronxville, is that No, right? no. We looked in the city uh, for about two days and we realized we couldn't afford. You know, <laughs> we owned our own house in, uh, in New Orleans. Right. We lived in Uptown near Tulane. We had a uh, raised, Queen Anne raised cottage. And we had uh, a child, and not child, our son was in college and one in high school and one in grade school. And, uh, soon realized we could not afford a place to fit out. Well, we didn't need a big house, but... And I asked, where are the best public schools in the New York area? And they said, Bronxville. That's nice to hear. That's we got on the train. So it came we got out. off of the platform right over uh, across town here. And I turned to Kathy and I said, I don't know how, but this is where we're going to settle. <laughs> And we did. Love we of her sight. Well, I uh, love the town, but also uh, the, the schools, and uh, we've, uh, we've really loved Bronx mm -hmm. over 17 years. Well, now let's get back to this. So suddenly you find yourself uh, the CEO and the director of the biggest, one of the biggest mu museums in the city of New York. Uh, how did you go about, you know, pulling it all together? I know you had huge capital projects. Well, there's what? a simple equation, actually, to run any business, including museums. People, program, money. Get the right people, develop the right programs, and you attract the money. Mm -hmm. Because it, money makes the engine go. Right. And uh, You I, have a background in strategic planning, too, too don't yeah, you? Yeah, I've done that. strategic plans for the Museum of Louisiana. And the first thing I did was one for uh, the Museum of the City of New York. Mm -hmm. How are we going to take this great collection, this great subject, that people viewed as that little toy museum on Fifth Avenue and make it a center of learning for New York. Mm -hmm. And the first job was to attract the people. Uh, Dylan Ripley, when I left the Smithsonian back in 1966. The long time. Long time back. The, the when I left, he, he said two things because I left to be a director. He said, once a director, always a director. And always remember, you're no better than your staff. And I've always remembered that second part. Yeah, uh, you And aren't. so I, I uh, gathered together some tremendous people to help put this museum back together and make it what it potentially always could be, mm -hmm. a world-class museum about this great city. Right. And where did you get these people? I mean, where did you gather them from? You just ro uh, sort of robbed them from museums? Well, uh, the I knew, I knew uh, mostly from the East Coast. Uh, Being president of the National um, AAM, it, yes. the American Association Museum. Right, must have been very helpful to know where it the was, bodies were. Because I traveled the country speaking, yeah. and uh, I, obviously young folks uh, who were inspired by the idea of creating this great museum about New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, so I gathered them from the Winter Tour, I gathered them from uh, New York State Museum, uh, the Smithsonian, and other places. And we started to uh, create a structure, a staff, a new business plan for the museum, and began to raise the money. And then you did some capital projects on the uh, well. The first thing we location did, there, yeah, yeah. Uh, it became obvious the building couldn't serve for a modern museum. So mm -hmm. I uh, 
brought in architects, and uh, Bess Myerson was the commissioner of cultural affairs. Oh, that's there. right. And, and Bess uh, really got it started. She came into my office the first time I met her, and she said, "My favorite museum." <laughs> and I said, Commissioner Myerson, why is this your favorite museum? She said, you never asked me for any money. I said, you know, if I start asking for money, we'll become disfavored. She said, no. And she gave us some seed money to bring in architects to look at the existing conditions of the building, which were pretty bad. Mechanical, electrical, the whole thing had to be redone. We raised money working with the city, because it is a city-owned building, just as the Met building is city-owned, right. American Museum of Natural History. It's Do you report then to the mayor? I mean, no. how, there's, you're separate, though, as yep. a uh, Well, New York entity. developed, uh, in the late 19th century, this system of public sector, private sector partnership, which today is called the Cultural Institutions Group. There are 33 institutions that have a partnership with the city. The Museum of the City of New York dates back to 1927. Mm -hmm. Basically, the city funds the museum's security staff. And this is true with the Met, the Kent Botanical Garden, Brooklyn All Museum. All of those, okay. Yeah. But the properties are owned by the city. Uh -huh. they're, they're built by private money, but given to the city. And then on capital projects, it's also a partnership, usually 50-50. Uh, so with James Stewart Polshek, we developed a master plan. And He's a key architect, right. Absolutely. Uh, famous, uh, yeah. Has done very important work all over the world. And Jim, uh, we developed this grand plan and finished all except the bidding uh, documents, approvals of the Art Commission and uh, every historic district commissions uh, to uh, transform the property on Fifth Avenue into this new museum. and. Uh, when we, right before we were able, or not able to, about to uh, uh, implement that plan, uh, Mayor Giuliani asked me, uh, asked me down to City Hall and sat and in his office, and he pointed out the back window of his office, his ceremonial office at the uh -huh. Tweed Courthouse, which was surrounded in scaffolding, rusting, falling apart, and he said, what should we do with this? And I said, well, let me come back with a plan. And we came back with a plan called. Now, how, when, what, what, was this early in his administration? No, it was or? in the summer of 1998. Or actually, in the spring of 1998. Yeah. And came so they had already begun to do, to no, do renovation. Nothing, they nothing, had done nothing. Nothing had been so done. So you were building. really in on the uh, we ground gave him, floor. We gave the mayor a reason to restore it because it was obvious it was going to cost a great deal of money. The yeah. building had been neglected for years. It is one of the great 19th century buildings of New York over the United States. I think everybody was just amazed when all the little rooms and everything were torn away and this beautiful, gorgeous Oh, it's gorgeous absolutely gorgeous and it's a, it's a palace in a way. Yeah. Of course, when it was built, it was one of the most expensive buildings ever built in uh, the United States. Right. Uh, but a great testament you know, originally it was going to be the new city hall of New York, right. facing north as New York became the Empire City at the beginning of the Civil War, and it was going to be a great monument. Actually, it was to challenge Washington, D.C. as the capital, and this was going to be the capital building for the, for the Empire City. That quickly changed to become the New York County Courthouse, fortunately, because the 1815 City Hall of New York City is a magnificent testament yes. to New York. Uh -huh. This delicate little building is where the powers running the most important city in the world work. It's a real testament to democracy, mm -hmm. actually. In any case, it was a so, courthouse. Now, what was your game plan? You said you he asked no. you for a, a, a blueprint, and you came back. I mean, what came what back uh, in about three months? Uh, came back with the idea of Gateway New York. Uh -huh. It was going to be an annex to the Museum of the City of New York, and it was a place where New Yorkers and visitors to the city could enter the city intellectually. Why is New York the way it is today? How did this city happen to become the city that we know? So what a you wonderful learn, theme. You learn that intellectually yes. through the collections and exhibits, and then there was going to be a visitor center run by New York City and Company so that after learning the high points or getting a structure to understand New York and enjoy it, you go out and explore this great museum without walls, which is New York City. And you Isn't can plan your tour, idea. Uh, lifelong learning, uh, learning from the city through uh, New York City and Company, the collaboration with the Museum of the City of New York. So it was a gateway to the city of New York. Wow. And as most of you know, a new mayor came on board, Mayor Bloomberg, and uh, decided against it. He did. And Why? I mean, what well, could have possessed I, this if mayor? If I knew the answer to that, so? I'd write a book. Oh. But it's, it's been a mystery to many people, Yeah. to the, the museum's funders, to our trustees, to many supporters. I received a packet the other day from a, a grade school in Naples, Florida, with letters 
to Mayor Bloomberg from the students of the school, please allow the Museum of the City of New York to continue, continue. its program at the Tweed because we had worked for four years and spent millions of dollars to create this great museum about one of the most significant cities in human history. Right. It, I think everybody was shocked. Uh, well, the, the, we don't know, and I, I don't think the story is completed yet, although the, the story, that side of the story of the Museum of the City of New York, at least for the next four years, will not be moving there. Mm -hmm. We've had to uh, cancel all of our uh, You had quite an investment in it, too, had well, you? Well, we had, we had engaged Ralph Applebaum, one of the world's great exhibition designers, uh, Cooper Robinson and Partners, our architect. We were developing a, a new library, a center of learning, uh, exhibitry. New York, New York City of Nations was the major exhibit where you'd walk through the history of New York and, and really kind of get a sense why the city is the way it is. Yeah. And you know, if you understand the history of New York, mm -hmm. you really love New York. Right. Because well, you go back before the Dutch, I'm sure, uh, with First the Indians. Nations, First Nations, the Lenny Lenape, the Delaware tribe. Right. And that section of uh, that uh, the major exhibition is called First Nations. Mm -hmm. It shocked uh, many, shocks many people to know what that there the are thousands, thousands of people here before the Europeans came. When the Europeans came up the river, People were all around. On the banks saying hello. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that at all. And I thought I knew something yeah. about well, New York what, City. That's what I mean, I knew there were Indians it. here because they sold the Man island of Manhattan for $28, right? But, uh, 24. 24. I'm but sorry, inflation. I get my you history know, inflation. <laughs> $24 in goods. <laughs> in goods. Yeah. Is there any truth to that? Uh, somewhat. Uh, they, with the value is a question, but uh, the Dutch did rent Manhattan Island because the Indians did not have the concept of ownership of land. Uh -huh. But for the privilege of using the land, the Dutch did give the trade goods worth, they say, uh, in terms of late 19th century terms, $24. Mm. So many guilders, I forget right. what it is. And when did the magic time come when suddenly it was not the Indians, but suddenly... Uh, well, in the uh, 16, early 1620s. And, uh, now that's, we're talking Plymouth. Well, we're talking the time of Fort New Bill Amsterdam. Brooks, yeah, when, um, and uh, it's, the, if you understand the history of New York, you understand that the character of New York was formed very early on. Mm -hmm. And three fundamental uh, elements in that character. One is diversity. There were 20, uh, there were 18 different languages spoken in, in New Amsterdam in 1648. Uh, there, I would, I'm just Today, amazed. there are 160 languages. There were obviously Dutch, but French Huguenots. There were Mennonites. There were Catholics. There were Jews. There was this a Muslim. In, in, in 1650. Yeah, there was a Muslim called the Turk. It's Diversity. Something. So that's the first element. Yeah. The second one uh, is that of all the uh, North American colonies, New York was not founded for religious or geopolitical reasons, founded for one reason. New Amsterdam was founded for one reason. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I fail. What, what, what was the reason? Make money. Make money. Well, Make money there the you have it. So I the think more that's things a thing. change, the more they well, stay the same. That's why knowing the history, the, yeah. uh, the entrepreneurial spirit well, and creativity. Why was it to make money? I mean, the, uh, for the, the, for the members trading, of uh, the investors of the Dutch West India Company. It yeah, was a company okay. town. Yeah. And the third element, which uh, people are surprised at, is that New York has been the cauldron of American democracy. It's where the struggle for indiv individual liberty has taken place, more than in Boston or Philadelphia beginning with those Dutch uh, settlers or those settlers in New right. Amsterdam demanding citizenship to uh, freedom of the press, to, uh, well, women's rights, gay rights, civil rights. I never, they were, they you were know, now fought. that you're putting it together. This is where American democracy continues to be formed. And so those three things we were going to in this great big exhibit called New York, New York City of Nations tell. Mm -hmm. Because if you understand that, then you become part of the history of this right. city and you feel it. You can walk through the city and say, I'm part of this continuum. It's still going on today. Hmm. Mayor Bloomberg, did you understand that? And do you know what you have just done? <laughs> I can't resist because, uh, you know. Well, we're going to tell those um, stories up. You have put your life into this. And well, it must have been life. tremendously disappointing. Uh, uh, it's a great disappointment. Disappointing. Uh, for, but yeah. for New York City, because we have great art museums, we right. have a great museum of natural history. This was going to be a great museum of history about New York, a visual history. Right. Exciting place. Is there place. any chance that maybe it can be revived? Well, when uh, I did tell the mayor uh, that, and his people, I'm a firm believer in the power of ideas. This is an idea that will happen someday. It will not happen now because mm -hmm. I think too much has gone on. 
and the mayor has made a commitment not to move the museum there, although people want us to move to Lower Manhattan. Uh, and it would be wonderful for Lower Manhattan. Well, it was going to add $19 million to Lower Manhattan's economy and $43 million to the city's economy. And for a lot of people, what has happened does not make sense. I think the story still is being played out, uh, but uh, the, uh, the museum will not be moving to the Tweed. Do you see the um, Mayor Bloomberg indicated he wanted to move the uh, Board of Education into that building and some schools there, um, which makes well, me personally weep, but do you see this happening or do well, you see him moving into that building or, or, or what do you see happening? Well, yeah, I can, I'm putting his, you on the spot, his, Robert. Histori <laughs> historians, historians cannot predict the future, <laughs> but I, I did tell my uh, staff and colleagues that if the Board of Education education ever moves into the Tweed Courthouse, I will walk down Fifth Avenue in my bathing suit. You've heard it. <laughs> so that's how I sure hope, I am of that. I hope you never have to uh, <laughs> I, no, I know. your bathing suit. Most people suit. hope that I don't Especially have to either. Especially not in the middle of winter. Uh, well, I might have to well, do it in the middle of the night, but no, I, it, it, that won't happen. The building, it will cost, they estimate, close to $15 million. The rooms are not conducive for that. It's all set up for museum purpose. The electrical grid, the windows are UF uh, filtered, the HVA system. To adapt it for office space would cost a great deal of money. Mm -hmm. And most people in the city feel that that, that will, uh, the Board of Education will not be moving in there. And there's 11 million uh, square feet of empty office space in Lower Manhattan right now. Right. And to take that out also of Brooklyn, Brooklyn doesn't want to lose the, the, those people working in, in the heart of Brooklyn near Borough Hall. Right. So uh, New York being what it is, there's, there are going to be a lot of rough spots before the Board of Education moves into the Tweed. I and don't most, think it'll be an easy battle for no. uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, we could just go on and on, uh, and unfortunately we can't, but I did want to point out that you have produced how many books? Uh, I mean, you haven't well, written involved. them from you know top to bottom in each case, but a number of I've been involved uh, in New York, uh, uh -huh. about 24 books and catalogs produced uh, for the first time, actually. Uh, the, what are some of the major ones? What are the well, ones? Well, the first one we money? did was the history of homelessness in New York. We did an exhibition at Catalog, and Brooke Astor actually funded it. Did she? Uh -huh. uh, but uh, we did a book on the history of public health called Hives of Sickness. Then uh, Our Town, images from the, uh, from the uh, Museum of the City of New York. Broadway, 125 years of musical theater. I, I love Broadway. Painting the Town, we did with Yale University Press just recently from an urban scene painting collection. Al Hirschfeld's New York. And uh, we're working on a book right now with Abrams called The Day Our World Changed, which will be a presentation with an exhibition of the art of young people in New York City responding to uh, September 11th. 11th. Oh, and when is that due to be September. published? It'll be, it'll be coming out in September. It will be our anniversary show for the uh, uh, 911. Yeah. Now, regrettably, as most of you know, Robert has decided to resign. So you'll be leaving the museum as of August 31st? August 31st. And what next? Well, I that's know a you're good not question. going to be sitting around. My children ask me that. Dad, do you have a job yet? <laughs> and you've got your life insurance, but you need yeah. a job, right? Your, uh, your no. Uh, you know, I've been, uh, I've been in New York, uh, director of the museum for 17 years. I've been working uh, in museums for 37 years, and I've loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been approached about being director of other museums, uh, uh, not, unfortunately, not here in New York. Uh, but uh, I've also been approached by universities. I've been approached by some commercial outfits. Uh, a very dear friend of mine, who uh, I won't mention his name, was involved in a very big uh, uh, merger in New York recently. I'm it's trying to think who this yeah, could well, be. But, <laughs> but in any case, he said, don't make a quick decision. You have yeah. time. And we do. Our children are grown. Yeah. And uh, I, certainly I'm not retiring. Uh, first of all, Kathy wouldn't allow me to retire. <laughs> but, uh, you make her sound like a slave driver. No, no, no. This, uh, Kathy is a good friend. She is <laughs> she, very well. Yeah, she, and uh, a wonderful person. She knows me too well, though. I would be unhappy uh, right. if I weren't active. Oh, with and, all uh, that you've done. Yeah. Well, I've been doing some work for the State Department, as you may know, on 911, and I just came back from Delhi, India, actually, where we mm -hmm. opened an exhibit there that the museum organized. You traveled really rather for two weeks straight. Yeah, uh, I went to Dam Damascus, Syria, and met with, uh, we're trying to set up. A heck of a time to travel in that area. It was uh, to a great deal of tension. I've yeah. never been to Damascus, and uh, of course, 
We have a show right now at the museum called A Community of Many Worlds, Arab, Arab American New Yorkers, the history of Arab Americans in New York. And mm -hmm. a book will be coming out next month from Syracuse University that I put together on that subject. Never been done before. Yes, and it's important. Uh, but in any case, we in the, in the mu larger museum community, we're trying to uh, establish broader exchanges between American museums and museums in the Arab-speaking world. We know so little about the Arab world, and we absolutely need to. Yes. They are reaching out to us, our colleagues. There's no anti-Americanism on a one-to-one -one basis. They are obviously upset from their perspective on what they view as a one-sided view of what's happening in Israel-Palestine. But they do want closer relationships with their American colleagues. So working with the State Department and the American Association of Museums, we are going to try to do that over the next several months. So I have a lot of things going on in addition to that. Yeah. But, uh, it's an I'm, exciting world. It is. Well, uh, history, uh, I often tell students, if you think history is boring as a profession, uh, think about all the different things you can do with it. You can teach, you can be a museum work, you can be an archaeologist, yeah. an anthropologist. Right. Uh, but if, if you want to be a good historian, you have, to, you have to be interested in people, because history ultimately is the story of people. People, yeah. Now, um, we're going to have to end this, but you are on the Bronxville Historical Conservancy. Very proudly so. I'm and you board. have gotten some wonderful speakers for us. Well, I've been involved in George Plimpton. And, and Paul Goldberger, the first Paul, speaker, right. who I thought did a great job of, of really defining Bronxville as place and why Bronxville is so, so, so unique, unique and, and important. Right, from the New Yorker, yeah. And uh, I got Robert Kennedy Jr. was involved in getting that. Uh, Bob Briggs and I worked on that. And uh, I've been advising the Conservancy on grant making and some of their programs. Mm -hmm. So it's been uh, my volunteer work here in, in uh, Bronxville, my way to really get to know my neighbors better than, because right. every morning I'm headed off to the city and every night I come back, I sometimes very late. Uh, but Bronxville is my country home. Right. And, and I put so the old professor here. side of you and the idea of maybe Bronxville seniors, you mentioned earlier, getting really involved in the history of New York, of Bronxville. Right. Doing uh, something well, uh, Bronxville uh, students, uh, people, we have a large retired population here, getting involved in understanding and documenting and thinking about Bronxville as place. Because place is important. Time, place, and self mm -hmm. are the elements of really uh, a balanced society, of understanding that. And there's so many things that young people and seniors and young families can do here in Bronxville to better know this community and know each other and ultimately to better know themselves. Yeah, and it is a special community. Well, thank you so much, well, Bob, for uh, joining me. Um, we'll be interested to see if you have to walk down Fifth Avenue in a... In a be a nightmare if I have to, for <laughs> everybody, keep my including crossed, me. <laughs> uh, that you don't. Again, thank you very much, and thank you very much for joining us. Good night.